Well, thank you very much, George, for another masterful performance. I must say that I am honored and delighted to have been invited to chair this fifth and last lecture in the series. And maybe it's appropriate that the London School of Economics should come in at the end um, as we came in at the beginning. And in his first lecture, George talked about his time at the LSE uh, in the late 40s and some of the intellectual foundations of his current worldview, which arose from his interactions with Karl Popper at that time. Now, if you were an audience in London, you could see George Soros and me performing on stage every night of the week. Indeed, you could do so tonight. I see some slightly baffled faces. Uh, George knows what this means in that there is, in fact, a play about the financial crisis on at the National Theatre, a very large play by a man called David Hare, uh, in which both George and I are characters. Um, and we have only ourselves to blame for this because we talked to the author about the origins of the crisis and all our own words on the crisis are used but they are spoken by actors. And this, I think, and I'm sure George would agree, is a peculiar version of the problem he talked about in lecture four, which is the principal agent problem in that we are the principals, but we have dramatic agents acting on our behalf. As it happens, I think George's agent is rather good. Uh, while mine, as my wife pointed out, is too ample and well padded. Um, and all those hours I spend in the gym have gone to waste. But uh, you are not here, invited me here, I think, as a drama critic, but rather to respond to some of the recommendations that George has made in his last lecture. First, should I say uh, that I think he's absolutely right to emphasize that this crisis is quite unlike others we have been through, and that it does require a fundamental rethink of the way we oversee the world economy and regulate its financial markets. I happen to think also that he's right that the recovery is fragile and may well peter out in the next year or so, but I'm sure that George would accept that our views on that can be little more than hunches at this point. But I find it rather depressing that many commentators have now, after a period in which people were more ready to think fundamentally about whether efficient markets were an appropriate way of thinking about things and whether financial regulation was properly designed, that now many people have taken refuge in the positions they held before all this started. So we know that politicians on the left think it's all the fact, all the fault of too little regulation. The Wall Street Journal leader writers are absolutely convinced that it was all a problem of too much regulation. The French blame Anglo-Saxon capitalism, the Germans blame hedge funds. George Brown, Gordon Brown in London says it was a crisis like Bruce Springsteen was born in the USA and nothing to do with us. No doubt in this part of the world too, the Austrians blame the Hungarians and the Hungarians blame the Austrians. But I think we have to do better and I very much support George's general proposition that we do need to rethink some of the fundamental premises on which we have built the international monetary and regulatory system. Now on regulation, and I used to be the financial regulator in the UK for six years and have therefore been a member of all of the international groups, the Basel Committee and all of that, he is right to point out that the system is national and not global. And the fundamental point that global regulation as it is now conceived does not match the needs of global markets is correct. I think George might have gone on to add that there's another respect in which regulation is out of date and that is that it's built on the three pillar concept that there is 
banking, that there is securities, and that there is insurance, and never the three shall meet. And we know that some of the most toxic and dangerous elements of this crisis were precisely where these three interacted. So that AIG, which was regulated as an insurance company, was trading in the securities markets with banks and investment banks, and no one was looking at that picture in the round. So I agree with you, George, on that point, but I think you need to also look at the structure of the regulatory networks that we currently have. I also think it's important to distinguish the European problem from the broader global problem, and here I would have put the points a little differently. The key distinction in Europe, and this applies technically to the European economic area, not to the European Union, is that if you are a financial institution in Europe authorized in one place, whether it's Iceland or Latvia or London, then you can do what you like across the whole economic area. And there is no local purchase, if you like, by local regulators on those institutions. And that was the fundamental problem with Icelandic banks in the UK and in the Netherlands, and indeed with banks in Western Europe operating in Eastern Europe who withdrew their liquidity when the crisis was at its peak, and there was nothing that the local authorities could do about that. That flaw needs to be corrected. You can either dismantle the single financial market if you wish, but that would have other costs, or you need to produce some central authority to oversee these pan-European institutions. After Lisbon is agreed, and it looks after yesterday that that may well happen, it may be possible to make some progress. In my view, and this is perhaps a disloyal thing to say, the problem will turn out to be the United Kingdom and not Germany, uh, because it's the UK that is currently resisting the establishment of central regulatory authorities in Europe. There is also, of course, as George pointed out, the broader issue of the structure of the Eurozone and the absence of a central fiscal or perhaps resolution authority, which will take a bit longer. Uh, but I think that it is possible to imagine a European resolution authority, at least for failing institutions, even if one can't get as far as a central fiscal authority with broader powers. Globally, I think the issues are a little different. Some things have been done, as George recognized. We've had G20 summits, and we have broadened the membership of the key international groupings. It was absurd in the past that over the last decade, the central organism that has been supposed to oversee global financial stability has been the Financial Stability Forum, as it then was, it's now become the Financial Stability Board. But that body excluded China, it excluded India, it excluded Brazil, for example. And so the big elephant in the room over the last decade of the emerging huge global imbalances, as we now call them, was one which could not be addressed in that forum. The key participants were not in the room. But there is, I think, in addition to the membership point, which is being addressed, a broader question, which is why it is that in the financial area, there is no World Financial Organization like the WTO. In trade, governments have recognized that it may be rational for them to concede some element of sovereignty to a global body on the basis that they all do gain by free trade, and there needs to be some policeman to ensure that people don't break the rules with impunity. It seems to me that we do all benefit from an interconnected global financial system, as long as it is appropriately regulated. But governments have not been prepared to make any concession to a global body in relation to the oversight of that system. The US has been the main resistor. The US indeed refused even the modest steps that were put in place after the Asian crisis, where the IMF was given the authority to assess people's regulatory systems. 
and the US was the one country that refused to allow an IMF inspection of its regulation on the basis that US financial regulation was obviously unimprovable. Um, now, they may now, I think, take a slightly different view, but the summits have so far failed to engage with this fundamental question of whether it is rational to consider the cession of some elements of financial sovereignty to a global body in the interests of ensuring that the system does not disintegrate, as I think it is at risk of doing, as George pointed out. I hope that one of the summits, or a grander Bretton Woods conference, as George recommends, will come to address that point. But at the moment, it's hard to be optimistic. Finally, before I open up to the audience, both in Hong Kong and here in Budapest, just a word on what George said about the role of China. I completely agree that one consequence of this crisis will be a further shift in the center of economic gravity to the east. For the students here who like this kind of thing, there are some French economists who have attempted to calculate precisely where the world's center of economic gravity is. I'm sure George knows. But I won't embarrass him by asking. But actually, it has moved. This is a, a calculation done by uh, a least squares method, which is the point in the world which is least far away from where all the rest of economic activity is. And 15 years ago, it was just near Reykjavik. Um, <laughs> eccentric, but if you think about it, uh, and think of North America and Western Europe and China, it, you can see. There's some rationality to that. And it has moved in the last 15 years from Reykjavik to Spitsbergen. <laughs> so if you wish to be at the center of the world's economy, Spitsbergen is the place for your next holiday. But uh, more seriously, I think we do have to recognize that shift. And we do have to engage. And also the Chinese rightly have to recognize that they are more important and that they can't just be in world for a passive and be just price takers, as it were, which I think has been their attitude so far. I'm privileged to be a member of the International Advisory Board of the Chinese Banking Regulator and the Securities Regulator as well. And I think that the policymakers there do recognize the risks they run from unbalanced growth. They recognize the risks they run uh, from the way in which they have sought to stimulate their economy. The fiscal stimulus has gone largely through the banking system, and huge increases in bank lending have occurred, some of them in directed bank lending. And they do understand, I think, the risks that they run. As George says, the structure of their growth is intimately bound up with the nature of the political regime. I think the lesson the Chinese have sort of learned, although they don't say it quite explicitly, is that excessive reliance on export-led growth can be a vulnerability, can lead you into a position where your economy is vulnerable to events which you cannot control. Uh, but escaping from that growth model is difficult, and I think does involve integrating the Chinese much more closely into the world economic system so that they come fully to understand the true nature of their interdependence with the rest of us. Now, I'm sure that George's speech will have generated many thoughts and questions in your minds. And so what we're now going to do is, first of all, go to Hong Kong, where I know there are two or three questions, certainly, that will be asked. Uh, so I think we'll begin there. After that, we will come back and we will hear from uh, Senator Buarque, uh, who is on the front row, and then we will open it up uh, to you. But let's go first to Hong Kong, where I believe someone is waiting. Yes, indeed, on the screen I can see to ask the first question. Thank you. Uh, greetings from the University of Hong Kong. We're uh, honored to be with you today. Uh, and my name is Rusty Todd, and I teach business journalism here. 
Uh, the event at this end today was organized by um, the Journalism and Media Studies Center and the School of uh, Economics and Finance. As you can tell, we've got a packed house. There are many faculty members here, but uh, we're going to allow all three of our questions to come from our students, uh, whom we're very proud of, and uh, I will turn it over to them. Darcy, first question. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you, uh, Mr. Saurus. My name is Darcy. I come from mainland China, and I'm now in my year three, uh, majoring in economics and finance. Uh, my question today is about China. Uh, you know, on one hand, China is growing as a more and more influential economy in the world, and many people say that uh, Shanghai is going to be a new financial center in Asia. But uh, on the other hand, uh, the Chinese government is imposing a tight control over its economy and its financial markets to ensure its economic um, stability and privileges in international trade and etc. And this is, uh, I think, it's certain to uh, limit the growth of its financial markets. And so uh, my question is, uh, in your opinion, how would the Chinese government uh, try to resolve such a paradox, and um, particularly for Shanghai, do you think that it would really become an international financial center or just a regional or domestic one? Thank you. Thank you. George. I, I think your, your question actually is more about Hong Kong uh, than China. <laughs> and I think your, your analysis is basically uh, uh, accurate. And I think that it means that Hong Kong will continue to play a very important role uh, because of the uh, international uh, character of Hong Kong and the, the rule of law that actually prevails in, in Hong Kong and therefore facilitates uh, uh, international uh, financial uh, transactions. While Shanghai will undoubtedly grow in, in importance. Uh, I think that uh, uh, Hong, Kong, uh, Hong Kong's role in the world, I, I think, is pretty well assured, uh, provided the system hangs together. Thank you. Can we have a second um, question from Hong Kong? Yeah. My name is Natasha Khan, and I'm a Master's of Journalism student here at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Mr. Soros, do you think that the Copenhagen talks will produce a global plan for dealing with climate change? And do you think the global financial system can come up with the huge amounts of money needed to pay for such a plan? Thank you. Uh, it's a very good question. I'm afraid the chances of an international agreement uh, of substance in, in Copenhagen are, are rather, rather low. Uh, because while most countries now genuinely recognize uh, that there is a very serious uh, global problem, and they, I think the, the, the uh, change in China's attitude is particularly impressive. I was in, in China in 2005, and then again, I, I returned uh, uh, just last year. And the, uh, the transformation in China's attitude is really quite remarkable. They realize that the, even though they are being pushed by the rest of the world, that it, they have internalized the need. They have seen the pictures of the Himalayan uh, uh, glaciers melting. And they already have a water problem in North China. And they realize that they, it's liable to then uh, mm. uh, also affect South China. So China is definitely on board. But the, the, the approach taken in China is very different from the approach taken uh, uh, in Europe. And again, Europe is different from the United States. And therefore, while it may be possible to have some general global targets, uh, unfortunately, it is, I think, almost impossible to have an international system uh, 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 that would uh, establish a, 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 an international price on carbon, which is, I think, really what is needed to, to bring the problem on, under, under control. Uh, now, I think there is 
an opportunity to create some international fund, a very substantial international fund uh, uh, for dealing uh, globally, particularly in the field of uh, forestry and agriculture, where the, the, the savings, the potential for savings is actually the, the, the greatest. Uh, uh, I didn't go into it in my speech, uh, but actually the, the issue of SDRs uh, provides that uh, opportunity. And since the rich countries don't need the extra reserves, uh, they could uh, uh, renounce the allocations and it could be used uh, uh, for a global fund uh, for uh, 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 taking care of uh, uh, prote protecting uh, uh, the uh, forests in, the, in, 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 the, um, in Brazil and uh, in Indonesia and other places. Uh, and also to uh, put up a fund for uh, adaptation uh, for those countries that are, mm. that are going to be most badly hurt uh, and don't have the resources of their own, like Bangladesh uh, and, 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 and Africa. Now, the SDRs, of course, a very f f special kind of instrument, uh, which it, there's a cost to uh, using it. And that somebody has to pay that cost. And the, the gold reserves of the IMF uh, have been designated to be used for the least developed, uh, uh, benefit of the least developed countries. So I think it could be used, the, the gold reserves could be used to pay the cost of the use of SDRs. And that's how an international fund uh, uh, could be financed. And I think this would be, uh, this is something that actually can be done. On, on, uh, uh, it is already done. The, this has happened uh, on a small scale. And I think a, a fund of 100 billion could at least be put together, mm -hmm. even in time for Copenhagen. But do you think there's a problem of American, of lack of American leadership on this, and just that Obama has had a recession to deal with? He's had. Uh, the uh, health care to deal with, he's got Afghanistan to deal with, and it's simply the issue doesn't seem to be getting the political attention in Washington. No, you are absolutely right, and it's actually, it isn't uh, President Obama's uh, interest in the subject that stops it, uh, stops America from taking the leadership. There is a particular law in America uh, that that uh, uh, specifically applies uh, to the use of SDRs, the American SDRs. Uh, and so America, uh, it requires the government to go to, the, uh, to Congress for authorization. They would need legislation. Mm -hmm. it, that is not the case uh, in European countries. So actually, European countries could do it without America. It wouldn't cost them anything because the IMF would be paying for it. And this would be a great opportunity for, for Europe to take leadership. It's high time that Europe should show some, some, some area of leadership. Mm. And because America is handicapped, sort of more or less uh, tie, hands tied, this would be the, 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 the time for Europe to take the leadership. And they are genuinely concerned. And of course, America could come along. It would take them a yes. little longer. So that might be a job for the new European president, whoever that will turn out to be. Are you a candidate for that job? <laughs> I think you'd be a, there'd be a lot of supporters. Um, let's have the third question from Hong Kong. Hi, George. Um, my name is Yue Yang Lu, and I'm also from uh, the uh, Journalism and Media Studies Center. I studied journalism in the University of Hong Kong. And um, as you have been talking about the necessity and importance of uh, international cooperation and global regulation in a new era, I would like to have your opinion on regional free trade agreements. Um, do you think they are helpful, or do you think they just get in the, pro uh, get in the way of uh, global progress? Thank well, you. it's a, it's a very you. good question, and there is really no uh, simp simple answer to it because uh, uh, regional agreements could be a, 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 a handicap or it could be a stepping stone. 
uh, and I think a, a proper uh, uh, international structure would involve regional cooperation agreements uh, as well as an international one. I think there is scope for both. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll leave Hong Kong. We reserve the right to come back to you uh, later if we uh, have time to do that. But I'm now going to ask Senator Buarque from Brazil, uh, who is on the front row. That's right, bring up the lights and wait for the microphone, who is going to... Maybe come up here for a moment. Sure. Do that. sure. I was asked to make an abstract of these five hours lectures in five minutes. <laughs> and I hope I'll do it. The way was to put the whole lectures together, choosing keywords. I chose 10 keywords of your speeches. And I put them together in groups of two. First is reflexivity and manipulation. I'm living here, Mr. Soros, uh, believing that uh, there is an epistemological problem to understand reality, as you put. And uh, reality is being manipulated by agencies and the agents. The second two words is bubbles and market fundamentalism. I'm living, believing that uh, the bubbles, these silent atomic bombs of this time, they were created by the market fundamentalism. And we need some careful regulations. The third group of two words is private interest and common goods. I'm living, believing that private interest alone will not bring common goods. We need the, a lot of others ideas, proposition, and even philanthropy to put private interest together with the common good. The fourth is open society and democracy. I'm living with the idea that democracy is necessary, but not enough to have an open society. We think after the words of Mr. Soros, as I think I am not, I'm not speaking for you. This is my abstraction, my, my, my work. I think that we need moral values over even the power of majorities. The democracy alone will not work. And fifth, today we have two words, uh, international cooperation or national dependence. American, Chinese, or even the G20 group against the whole of the world. We need to have international cooperation and not just some one, two, three countries putting their power. This is the abstract. Now I want to put, I have enough, uh, I have yet two minutes. <laughs> I want to put uh, some questions, not to answer today, just to keep it, think about that. One is from the philosophical point of view. Not only to look for the epistemological problem of reflexivity, but also to the ontology of wealth. What is wealth? How to define correctly wealth? The other is how to put the national open societies in a planetary open civilization. Because the open society, each one of them is national. How to cope with migration? How to cope with ecology? How to cope with international unemployment? And all other planetary problems. And at least, <clears throat> I cannot avoid to say, Mr. Soros knows me, one time more, not for today, Mr. Soros, what is the role of education to oh. change the, of education to change the world? I see no other way to substitute capitalism, socialism, but educationism. 
And Mr. Soro, I just want to say to you and to the rector that personally, I thank you very much for these days. I hope you have energy to keep this kind of job you are doing now for many, many years. You have to take these speeches and lectures all over the world. And Mr. Rector, please take the Central European University as the platform to put Mr. Soros around the world. Thank you very much. Do you want to answer? I guess, uh, yeah, you should say something, yeah. Thank you. Well, some, some huge questions there, George, which could uh, require five more lectures to answer, I think. The ontology of wealth, a global open society, and the role of education. But do you, do you want to pick up? Well, I, I, I think it would require, actually, uh, three lec lectures. Uh, um, uh, they're very, very good questions. Um, uh, wealth is a, it's an interesting thing. Um, uh, um, it reminds me of uh, uh, traveling in the, uh, the Air, uh, Air France uh, uh, a plane. Uh, uh, the the um, uh, stewardess saw me look, uh, looking at some charts, and and she looked at it, and and she said uh, uh, something to the effect that that uh, 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 wealth is is somehow connected with death. That it's it's not alive. Uh, that that life is something else. I don't know. It's pretty profound. Uh, I thought at the time, and from maybe <laughs> I'll I'll take a lecture to expand expand on that <laughs> later. Uh, uh, it, of course, um, the the role of civil society, I think, is an international civil society. It is very important, and I think it's going to be a driving force, uh, because after all, a, a, a democratic governments uh, are generally speaking responsive, responsive to the demands of uh, mm. uh, their their uh, their population, and in that in that sense, I think China, while it's not. A democratic uh, country is also what distinguishes it that the leadership is responsive to, to the demands of the population. They, they are very, very sensitive to it. Uh, so, so I think that if there is a demand on the part of civil society uh, for greater international cooperation, it will drive uh, the, the, uh, 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 the leaders. Uh, the governments uh, to, to, towards that. So I think it's a very, very important uh, factor. It already is, and it mm. ought to be more so. And the th third thing was education. And of course, I, I think that, uh, I mean, this reflexivity, while it's a very simple concept, that's probably why it uh, hasn't been recognized. Uh, it's too simple, it's too common sense. Uh, nevertheless, it does make it more difficult to solve human problems to, 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 because in trying to understand uh, uh, human affairs, you are shooting at a moving target. It's not something inert, mm. but it's, it's interactive. And your attempt to understand reality changes reality. And that makes it much more difficult. So I think uh, uh, to, education has to play a very important role in enabling us to deal with these rather complex uh, human uh, and political and social problems more effectively. Thank you. Now, the, the rest of you here have been all very patient so far, but it now is your turn. Yes, and I see uh, a hand here. Could you wait for the microphone to come to you because particularly the people in Hong Kong won't hear and give your name that'd be helpful thank you um, my name is Patrick Ladung and well I'm just a regular Austrian banking supervisor but um, still I would like to ask a provocative question um, do you because as an Austrian I know exactly which problem you address um, 
Do you think that the most powerful men and women have not enough honor to give up a little bit of power to sustain freedom in future? That's my question. And uh, last but not least, Austrians do not blame Hungarians. Austrians blame Germans. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we all know, oh, Thomas Bernhardt told us that sometimes they are not right. <laughs> Thank you. Could you repeat it? Well, it, the question is quite a philosophical question as to whether uh, one of the fundamental problems we have is that people with power um, are unwilling to cede any of it, even if that would be in the interests of generating a more yeah. free no, I mean, uh, I entirely agree, and this was sort of uh, very much at the heart of the agency problem uh, 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 that I was talking about because the our political leaders are supposed to be serving the interests of the people who elected them, and yet they put their personal interests uh, uh, ahead of sometimes of the of the uh, interests of the people whom they who elected them, and 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 they cling to power. Uh, I mean, in non-democratic states, that's a very big issue. Uh, lifetime president, presidency, uh, 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 but in, in democratic countries too, uh, the personal, uh, uh, the egos of of the of, of the leaders, uh, very often uh, stand in the. In the, in, the, in the way of, of, of the common interest. Uh, somebody over there has caught my eye. Yes, um, if you could take a microphone down. The man sitting on the aisle there. Thank you. That's the one. I'm Gabor Lipsch. I'm alumnus of the CEU Business School. Uh, Mr. Schorsch, do you think that there is a need for a, a world reserve currency as put forward by Mr. Robert Mundell, which might be a better tool towards uh, creating a level playing field between the countries of the center and those of the periphery, uh, as opposed to uh, special adjoining rights which are subject to scrutiny and, and regulation. Yeah. No, yes, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Keynes was the first one who proposed the Bancor as the, mm. as the international currency, but it was one step too far. And I'm afraid uh, the proposal of a, uh, a, an international currency uh, uh, is, is one step too far. However, the special drawing rights are a step in that direction because special drawing rights are a combination of the national currencies which are adjusted according to the, uh, to the relative importance of, of the countries. So it's a composite of national currencies. Uh, and I think that is, and that uh, it is actually uh, uh, a desirable uh, reform uh, to move in that direction. It's, it's, a, it's an extremely complex structure. Um, it perhaps uh, can be simplified, but also it would be further complicated by the admission of additional currencies, because mm. I think right now it's composed of the dollar, uh, the euro, uh, sterling, and the yen. And I think it, to be really uh, uh, representative, it would certainly have to imp include the renminbi and the real, and uh, maybe uh, a few other currencies. Uh, to, to, to make it really uh, a, a, mm. a, a more appropriate. But I'm very much in favor of that. And I think it, it is also in, 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 in the interest of the United States uh, now uh, to, to move in that direction. When you, uh, your ideas for a Bretton Woods that would look at all of this, I mean, how, how much political interest do you think there is in that in the US and in Europe, you know, when you when you meet political leaders, do do you get a kind of complete rejection, or do you think there is some interest? But, no, I'm afraid that I don't see the interest among the leaders. So that's another area where I think 
uh, a popular demand uh, would be needed to get you there. Um, and I think in particular for the United States, uh, since uh, we have had a, a, a great deal of benefit from it from the past, in the past, but some of that turned out to be illusory because mm. basically it allowed us to, the United States, to build up a, cr a chronic uh, current account deficit, which reached six and a half percent of the GDP at its at the at the end of a 25-year uh, uh, build-up, and that made everybody. It, it enabled America to spend six and a half percent more than it, it earned. Mm -hmm. So it made it fe it felt very good, but now. There is a very, very heavy price uh, to pay, and that should be enough to tell us that we really ought to do without it, that we would be better off uh, not for the dollar not to play that role, because it's built into uh, the system that if you have, uh, uh, if the dollar is the international currency, and if the world economy grows, you need more dollars. And where can the dollars come from? Only from the issuing country. Mm. So it builds the, the deficit into the, into the system, and it's not good. So I think it would be in our interest uh, uh, to move mm. away from it. I think I saw another hand, yeah, just quite near where the last one was. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Soros. Uh, I am, my name is Paula Korp. Uh, I am uh, French, and I'm a faculty member of the CU Business School. Uh, my question is the following. Uh, in the past, uh, there has been a tr huge trade deficit um, of the U.S. with East Asia. Uh, so this deficit has not changed much. It's just shifted from Hong Kong, Taiwan to China now due to the labor change. Why this deficit in the past has not caused such huge trouble but will uh, cause such huge change in the future? Thank you. It's a, the question is that why that the, the U.S. has been running a large trade deficit with East Asia for a long time. It used to be primarily with places like Taiwan and Hong Kong. It then shifted to the mainland. Why is it that in the past it didn't cause such instability and trouble, and more recently it has done? Well, it took 25 years for it to build up. Uh, it really started in the 80s, uh, 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 with what I called Reagan's imperial circle. Uh, 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 and it, it, has, it has just continued to build up. And actually, it, as I said in my presentation, it could have continued almost indefinitely because there were a willing lender and willing borrower. The United States was happy to, to spend more than it earned. And there were countries in, 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 in Asia that were very happy to, to build up uh, their wealth uh, mm. and, and build up their savings uh, that way. Uh, so uh, there was a symbiosis, uh, a symbiotic relationship. It would have continued. And actually, uh, for, uh, it is still continuing now because of the uh, uh, big stimulus applied in the United States. Uh, the, de the, uh, uh, the deficit is still very large, and China is, is still building up its uh, surplus. So actually, we haven't yet uh, started uh, correcting it. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really the housing bubble and what happened to the, uh, to the consumers and to the banking system that has brought this thing uh, to, uh, to, to an end. It's a combination of the trade surplus and the domestic uh, bubbles. Yeah, but, it, yeah. It, was the, it was the domestic bubble, the, uh, the housing bubble, that became unsustainable, yeah. not, the, not the deficit. That could have continued, as I say, for indefinitely. Now, I'm, at the LSE, I get into huge trouble if I don't take as many women questions as I take men. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm struggling because I can't see any women who want to ask a question. So I shall... Um, I shall pick on one of you soon, if you don't. But uh, there's somebody, there was somebody over here, I think. I couldn't, I, didn't I see a hand there? Yes, there's one there. Yes, that's the one. Thank you. Hello, hello Mr. Soros. Uh, 
Yes, the, a bearded woman. Have <laughs> Not a lady, but uh, hope Do your best. nice enough. <laughs> Mr. Soros, my name is uh, Omer Dar. I'm coming from Israel and I'm a student of the CU, in the CU. My question is uh, more regarding your uh, uh, previous lectures. You mentioned, you mentioned terms such as uh, uh, seeking for the truth, uh, uh, avoiding manipulation. Uh, you also mentioned that the uh, regulator should be the one the, to put the regulation on markets. But you also mentioned that uh, investors uh, are profit-oriented, and uh, this was acceptable by you. Uh, after this crisis, don't you think that uh, investors, especially the big players in the, in the markets, should have an ethical responsibility rather than just uh, going after the profit? Thank you. Shouldn't investors have more of an ethical responsibility rather than simply profit-seeking motivation? Well, as I said in my lecture, and I, I maintain that position, that as an investor in the, in, in, in the, in the financial markets, uh, you have, uh, uh, and if the markets are uh, uh, truly efficient with many participants, then the influence of an individual investor is minimal. It's at the very margin. Uh, uh, and, there, and therefore, you really are not responsible for the outcome. Now, you can organize, for instance, investors to act as a group, as, as was done in the case of South Africa. Uh, uh, and it was actually uh, uh, quite successful in bringing pressure on, 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 on Africa. Uh, so there are areas where investors could act as a group, a former group, and, and, and have an influence on legislation. Um, uh, actually, some of the legislation with regard to uh, 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 extractive industries is, uh, is relying on this kind of uh, uh, pressure. But in the normal course of events, uh, the, the, this is not w where the investors, individual investors, uh, can influence uh, the, the outcome. And it's where they can influence it, which is in legislation and in making of the rules. That's where they ought to put uh, ethical considerations ahead of their uh, personal interests. Thank you. Now, I do have a woman question um, over here, second row, and then I see someone behind as well. So, the, yeah, the no, the yeah, woman on the second row, that there, yeah, first, sure yeah, and then you, okay. I've got you. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, um, yeah, you got the woman, I'm from a very strange country with a different economic pattern as Argentina, uh, that has not been mentioned much here, but uh, I would like to hear more. Um, my question, well, I'm a PhD student in CU first. Uh, my question goes uh, more to, towards a summary of what has been discussing in here. And uh, uh, lately, um, this concept of social responsibility. I mean, I would like to know how, um, how this concept fits into the theory of reflexivity that uh, Mr. Scherz has been exposed here. And uh, if there is cert certain kind of a scope in this concept for, um, for generating these changes that he's looking for in agency and agents, I, I think that might be a chance in there. But I would like to know what is the opinion. Thank you. A student from Argentina, um, which hasn't been mentioned, interested in how the concept of social responsibility can be built into reflexivity and whether that uh, can help resolve some of the problems if people, market participants, had more sense of social responsibility. I guess it's a cousin of the question um, we've just had. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't uh, immediately respond to the question. I don't, I don't know how it could be used. Uh, I, if you have any suggestions, I'd be interested. I, I, doesn't, I don't connect immediately th this. I mean, are you, are you suggesting that I mean, what, what, one of the things uh, people sometimes argue is that if you impose uh, duties on corporations, on corporate social responsibility, et cetera, you could do the same thing with investors. 
Um, is, is that the kind of argument that you're suggesting? Uh, yeah, well, it's a sort of combination of everything because uh, um, Senator Warki uh, was uh, very concerned with this education and we, we address also a question in, in this discussion. I think the third session, the answer of Mr. Shores was that one solution uh, to, to the lack of answers we have solving crisis and the commitment of these agents in the international market, let's say, um, is... Uh, uh, connecting people through education and spreading this uh, reflexivity theory of, um, by education. So I was thinking that uh, the th uh, social responsibility can be a tool for solving the problem of agency and agents he's founding uh, in his evaluation of, of, of how the market is operating. And, and moreover, I think that uh, this education goal he has also can be spread by this concept of social responsibility. So I always felt that there is a need of discussion, the discussion that we are having here, not with this target of people, but those who actually are active participants of the market. So I always went back home, let's say, saying, okay, but I shouldn't be the one I am I, I being addressed, but someone else here <laughs> needs to be addressed. Mm. So, and I think that um, the concept of social responsibility can be a, a, a good nexus. I mean, Thank you. Yes, the no notion is that, I mean, it's partly linked to uh, what uh, Senator Buarque was saying about the need for education and to educate people to understand the way they are acting and your reflexivity, but that in, and her observation is that we shouldn't really be talking to students at the CEU, we should be talking to financial market participants. And how do you therefore you get your ideas across uh, to them and make financial market participants understand the broader framework within which they're operating and their social responsibility? Well, look, I, I think the same thing applies to financial market participants as to other citizens. Uh, namely, uh, when it comes to the making of the rules, and clearly you, you, are, you are in great need of financial reform, they should not be lobbying uh, for their private interests, their special interests. And it is happening right now in the United States, <clears throat> where, for instance, the legislation on reform is running into very serious opposition of, from, from the uh, local banks, mm. uh, uh, because there are quite a few abuses in the use of credit cards. It, it's really quite a, uh, I think, quite a shocking situation uh, how credit cards have been used uh, to exploit, uh, I would say, uh, in a way, the a vulnerable uh, segment of the population, vulnerable in the sense that they became in, indebted yes. to a new, they became users of credit cards and that made them vulnerable. And, and uh, if you look at uh, the kind of charges that are, uh, that are uh, uh, levied, they are really quite excessive. But the banks are defending it and, and, and re, uh, refusing to um, allow uh, a consumer protection agency uh, that would that would uh, uh, deal with that, and that is I think reprehensible. Uh, but I think the same applies uh, to other industries uh, uh, as as well. Okay. Now um, I've got one more question over there, and then but I'll I will take a question from. Um, Hong Kong after that if you have one and since I've just had a woman it doesn't have to be a woman nor does it have to be a man with a beard uh, it could be anybody so um, my next one over here uh, my name is Laszlo Wawra and let me ask you here from the very background of this uh, nice hall Mr. Shorosh pronouncing your name in Hungarian here in Budapest I would have two questions the question number one uh, is uh, the topic you lectured yesterday and before yesterday, and I would like to ask you whether in your uh, reflexive open society, in your mind, is it a deterministic world or a kind of stochastic world? The question is reasonable because uh, totally different uh, vehicles and methods are necessary in order to avoid contradictions. And I suppose that you as a as an inventor of a new system, let's say, uh, 
you try to achieve a contradiction-free system, or at least a system where the number of contradictions are as uh, less as possible. So in your mind, is it a deterministic or a stochastic word? And uh, question number two uh, Let's is, stick to one. Yeah, let's okay, okay, let's have that one. So, uh, <laughs> is, it a, uh, is your world of reflexivity a deterministic world or a stochastic world? It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a world of trial and error, definitely not deterministic. Okay, so your second one? Okay, so the second question is uh, about the regulation you mentioned in your today lecture. Uh, after the big crash in 1929, the US House of Representatives issued a so-called Glass-Steagall Act, which tried to uh, make a, a significant difference between very risky and less risky uh, products in the financial sector. In your mind, is uh, your proposition something very similar to it? Because so far I know this act, uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, has been ignored uh, um, at the end of the second uh, period of the Clinton administration. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, it's a, a, a question about Glass-Steagall. Um, is what you're proposing effectively a reinstatement of the Glass-Steagall division? But, uh, this is an open question, whether you need to go back there. I, I, I would look for a solution short of uh, a, a return to Glass-Steagall. I think it, it's... Um, First of all, it had its own, short, its own shortcomings. Mm. Uh, um, for instance, the fact that, that uh, the banking system was strictly uh, confined to individual states, it actually increased the risks of uh, uh, banks uh, concentration risk, particularly, particularly dependent on agriculture, yes. for instance, and so on. So it wasn't an ideal system to, uh, at all. Uh, so, uh, but I, I do think that you have to have internal separations of capital, uh, not only between uh, commercial banking and, uh, and investment banking, but, but investment banking participation in specific markets, because uh, you need to break uh, or, or, or reduce contagion going from one market yeah. to another. The, the abolition of these, these uh, uh, segmentation uh, resulted in contagion, both internationally and within markets. And it, you know, uh, the collapse of the subprime market then cascaded in, in remarkably fast to, um, to all kinds of other markets, some of whose existence I wasn't even yes. aware of, like, like um, uh, uh, municipal bonds. Auction rate securities. Au au auction rate. That's one I discovered too. <laughs> yes, there were markets we didn't know about yeah. that, that collapsed and hurt <laughs> the rest of the market. So you do need to comp compartmentalize. And, and I use the analogy to oil tankers which are where you build uh, 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 buffers so that the, the oil can't slosh around, because otherwise, yes. uh, uh, and I had the pleasure of uh, flying on a, an airplane, uh, a, a, a Russian uh, uh, um, Tupolev, uh, carrying uh, um, gas pipes uh, to, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, Bosnia, to, Sarajevo, and the crew had to constantly readjust the target so that we didn't roll over. So <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it, that's a good example. Good analogy. <laughs> now, I know it's getting late in Hong Kong, but do we have another question from Hong Kong? Yes? Good. Carlos, greetings from Hong Kong. Um, you, may, you mentioned earlier about the gap between the investment, investors' sentiment and the reality. But uh, Australia has recovered, China has recovered, and, uh, Ch and America has also, you know, seems to have recovered. So where do you identify as the gap between the mood and the reality? 
And there is a widespread fear of inflation because of the huge injection of um, government money into the economy. But do you think this is a misconception by itself because the, the money will eventually be withdrawn from the market? Thank you. He points out that a number of countries are already recovering, including now the United States. And so he's really asking where you see the, the areas of concern still are. Uh, but also, secondly, the second question is whether all this liquidity that's been injected in the system is likely to result in a resurgence of inflation. Yeah, well, the two are connected in a way because the recovery has been brought about by the unprecedented uh, use of uh, financial and fiscal uh, stimulus. Uh, and uh, 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 the, the, the problem is that certainly in the United States, I think you will continue to need uh, additional injections of stimulus to keep the economy going because the recovery is very much the result of that stimulus uh, uh, being applied. And uh, you haven't yet uh, uh, reduced the percentage of consumption as a percentage of the GNP. Uh, in, in the United States, it was up to 70%, which is too high. And it's got to uh, drop to low 60s. Uh, and it has dropped, of course. But at least part of the uh, half the drop is due to transfer payments, which came out of the stimulus. Mm. So that's the problem that's confronting the world, uh, which may not be fully uh, recognized. Uh, then, of course, the other side is that with all this injection of, uh, of uh, uh, liquidity, as the, the, uh, pri the uh, private lending or uh, 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 bank lending is restarted, uh, uh, the, uh, from deflation, you could flip over mm. into inflation. And uh, so, because you are facing this very complicated two step maneuver. Uh, I mean, the, the, the global economy, and particularly the American economy, was very far from equilibrium. And when you have this kind of far from equilibrium situation, to correct it, first you have to, uh, uh, when you're skidding, you have to turn the wheel the same way as the car is skidding, and then you have to correct it. So it's a, it's a two-step maneuver. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, how to execute a second step is a, a, the a big problem uh, ahead of us. Yeah. Um, I've got another one there, man in a blue shirt. Thanks for coming, Mr. Soros. My name is Chris Nicholson. I'm an American student in the One Year MBA program. And um, we're talking about um, a lot of uh, increased responsibilities in a way for our political leaders and uh, maybe our corporate board members. And so I'm curious whether you think we have the incentives in place right now to attract the top people that we want to occupy those roles, um, you know, in light of, of the burdens and risks that they, that they take in, in pursuing them at the same time. Both politicians and board members, you're correct. Thinking. Yeah, correct. Yeah, the last part of the question. Yeah, the question is whether we have, uh, given all of the burdens and responsibilities on both politicians trying to manage the system, but also uh, board members, um, whether the incentives and rewards are right to attract people into those key jobs, whether as political oversight or as board of directors oversight? Well, uh, um, I think it is actually very largely an ethical problem. Incentives alone uh, are, uh, I mean, you're, I presume that you're referring to the, to the extra responsibility that now affects board members under mm. the uh, new legislation. Uh, um, uh, I, I think that it is actually very largely an ethical uh, 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 problem uh, that the, the, the people in charge have to act in a way that they don't uh, 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 transgress the, the law. Mm. If it's purely incentives, 
uh, then uh, you, uh, there was, it was not enough uh, to stop from companies uh, doing things that they, they, they ought not to be doing, like uh, not, public, not disclosing information correctly. Uh, and I think that it would also inv involve that people who take on the responsibility would also have more respect for the work that they are doing. Yeah. Now, I think we're running quite up against time. I saw two more, and I'm going to take them together. Yes, these, these two, and then we'll make those the last questions. Man in black first, and then you. Okay, so thank you. I'm Stefan Chubian, PhD candidate uh, at Central European University. Um, my question refers to ordinary people. Uh, you've mentioned uh, today the importance of uh, civil society, and uh, at the end of the lecture yesterday, you mentioned that people are the most important in the system. However, most of the discussion centered rather on governments, markets, and elites. So I was wondering, first of all, what is the role of ordinary people in, in this framework? Second of all, uh, you mentioned uh, the increasing manipulation that we have in the relationship between governments and uh, ordinary people, citizens, let's say. Now, if this manipulation has increased and it affects somehow the basis of the system, it's, it means that we are somehow in problem because the base of the system is no longer capable of performing its role. So uh, my question here would be, how can the ordinary people regain their significance, their meaning in the system that we have? Thank you. Thank you. And then we'll take this other one here. Man in a pink, yeah, if we can get the microphone back. Red shirt, right. That's it. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I have no question. I'd like just to, to speak for a lady. I'm not a lady. <laughs> but I'd like to speak for my daughter. Uh, my name is Giorgio Moroshano, or George, if you wish. I'm proud to have a similar n name. Uh, I am a professor of mathematics at the Central European University. Uh, well, first I'd like to, to thank George for, uh, for your uh, great lectures. Uh, second, uh, uh, may, maybe you, you may remember uh, two years ago I offered you one of my books. Uh, uh, in fact, that book uh, was dedicated to you, George, because I consider well, uh, you are a, a great supporter of mathematics, uh, among my, many other things. And uh, now I'd like to offer another book. D don't worry, it's not my book. And in fact, it's your, uh, it's a, it is a, a Romanian translation of your book about uh, on uh, fallibility. Uh, the translation, well, it turns out that the translation belongs to my daughter, Laura. Um, uh, she is not, not uh, in Budapest at the moment. She is in Bristol, United Kingdom, and, and she asked me to, to offer you uh, the, this book. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, th this is a strong evidence that uh, your ideas are uh, very much appreciated everywhere in the world, including Romania. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a, a book that is a, one of your books translated into Romanian by his daughter, very uh, nice. uh, who is currently in Bristol. But um, here it comes. Yeah. There you are. Good. Thank you. Um, and then the previous question was really, uh, what happened to the people? Um, you, you talk about uh, the problem of democracy and particularly the problem of manipulation of people um, with, uh, well, I mean, your reflexivity theory being based on the notion that some of, uh, of what people are doing is, is deliberately manipulative. Um, how, uh, what should people be doing, ordinary people be doing, in the light of the fact that they are being manipulated, if you see what I mean? What, what is the role for the people? No, I think it's, uh, the, the ordinary people have a very big role. Uh, they must actually punish uh, those who lie to them particularly if it's deliberate deception. They, and they, they have the vote, and they should exercise it in that way. And that would discourage uh, uh, that kind of deliberate manipulation. I think they are, they are the ultimate judge. And if they exercise good judgment, we will have a well-functioning democracy. Thank you. 
I think we've, bought, we've run, uh, well, we ran past our scheduled time, but we ran our two hours. So uh, on my behalf, could I, uh, I know that John's going to uh, deliver a final thanks, but could I thank the audience both here um, and in Hong Kong uh, for making my job easy um, with lots of good, good questions. Um, and I'll then hand, I just want one personal comment is that all my life, I've been trying to find the secret of how to chat up Air France air hostesses. <laughs> and it's a bit late, but I now have discovered I need a few charts and graphs. Uh, and that's the secret. And that may be very useful to some of the men out there. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think Howard Davies has summed it up very well. You can see how many tips have been acquired during the course of this week. All kinds, in the market, in the Air France, all sorts of things. We have really had an extraordinary week, I'm sure you would all agree. We've been inspired, provoked, and challenged by our masterful and eloquent lecturer. And he, in turn, has been prodded and pushed and praised by our global audience in Budapest, in London, in Cambridge, in New York, in Shanghai, in Hong Kong today. And I think we'd all agree that we've come through far wiser, perhaps, than we were on Monday morning. There are many subjects that have been covered. Um, Howard Davies even took us into the theater today, which I found rather an interesting diversion when he told us that uh, he and George Soros are not only starring here on the stage in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, but also on the London stage. And I would only add the obvious, which is that George Soros, Soros is, uh, is starring on the world stage. And these lectures are the latest and in many ways the greatest of his many performances. And let me respond to Senator Buarque's challenge and say that we at CEU regard George Soros as our most distinguished lecturer and invite you, George, to continue to be our global superstar. I want to thank our overflow audience of students in Hong Kong, a wonderful uh, visual image that many of you have seen, and thank you for your questions. And our lively audience here in Budapest, our distinguished moderator, Howard Davies, our thoughtful commentator, Christovan Buarque, and above all, let me ask you to join me in saluting our superstar for his extraordinary performance throughout this week. Thank you. <laughs>